if there are two twin sisters who are very beautiful or equally beautiful and if they are walking down the streets of Toronto, maybe Young Street and if one twin sister she is wearing the Islamic hijab the complete body cover except the face and the hands up to the wrist and the other twin sister she is wearing the western clothes the mini skirts are short and if round the corner there is a hooligan there is a ruffian who is waiting for a catch who is waiting to tease a girl which girl will it tease? will it tease the girl wearing the Islamic hijab or will it tease the girl wearing the mini skirts or short after that the Islamic Sharia says, if any man rapes any woman, he gets capital punishment, death penalty. People say, death penalty? In this age of science and technology, Islam is a barbaric religion. It's a ruthless way of life. But when I ask this question to thousands of non-Muslims, that God forbid, if someone rapes your mother, rapes your sister, and if you are made the judge, and if the rapist is born in front of you, what punishment will you give him? And all of them, 100% said, we will put him to death. Some went to the extent of saying, we will torture him to death. So why these double standards? Someone rapes your mother, your sister, you want to put him to death. Somebody rapes somebody else's mother or sister, you say death penalty is barbaric law. Do you know, according to statistics, USA, which happens to be one of the most advanced countries in the world, do you know it has one of the highest rate of rape in the world? According to the FBI statistics, in 1990 alone, on average, every day, 1,756 rapes took place every day in the year 1990. According to the U.S. Department of Justice, in the year 1996, on average, every day, 2,713 cases of rape took place. In the year 1990, 1,756. In the year 1996, 2,713. Maybe the Americans got more bold. That means every 32 seconds, one rape is taking place in USA. You know, we are here in this auditorium, maybe for the past six hours. Already 600 rapes may have taken place in USA till the time you are here. I am asking the question that if you implement the Islamic Sharia in USA, that if any man looks at a woman, any brazen thought, any unashamed thought comes in his mind, he should lower his gaze. After that, every woman should be properly covered, complete body, except the face and the hands up to the wrist. After that, any man rapes a woman, capital punishment. I'm asking the question, will the rate of rape in America, in USA, will it increase? Will it remain the same or will it decrease? Will it increase? Will it remain the same or will it decrease? It will decrease. It's a practical law. You implement the Sharia and you get results. That's the reason I say Islam, besides speaking good things, it shows you a way how to achieve the state of goodness. Therefore, I say that Islam is the best way of life. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 19, Inna dina in the Allah al-Islam. The only religion acceptable in the sight of Allah is Islam. Takbir. Okay, unfortunately, we're running short on time, so we only have time for a few more questions. Uh, the next question is, what argumentation would you use to do da'wah to an atheist and or to a Christian or a Jew? And how would you introduce the topic to them? As far as doing da'wah to Christians and Jews, inshallah, I'll be giving a talk on similarities between Islam and Christianity, which you can hear tomorrow. As far as the first part of the question is concerned, how to do da'wah to an atheist? If you remember, I said earlier, the master key is Sulay al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 64, which says, Talo ila kalmitin sawa im bayna bayna kum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Now one may ask, what is a common term between the atheist? What common term can a Muslim have with an atheist? But yet, I call this the master key. The first thing I do when I meet an atheist is, I congratulate him. I congratulate him because he says, he does not believe in God. The reason I congratulate him is, all the other human beings, most of them, they are blindly following their parents. The Christian, he is a Christian because father is a Christian. The person is a Hindu because father is a Hindu. Most of the Muslims are Muslims because their fathers are Muslim. 
this atheist is thinking. His father, his parents may be religious, but he does not believe in the gods which his parents worship. The reason I congratulate him is because he has said the first part of the Islamic Shahada, Islamic creed, La ilaha, there is no God. The only thing I have to do is illa Allah, but Allah, which I shall do inshallah. Half my job is done. To the other non-Muslim, first I have to prove to him that the God he's worshipping is a wrong God, is a false God, and then prove to him what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here, half my job is done. He has already said the first part of the Islamic shahada, la ilaha. So my job, half my job is done. I have to only prove illa Allah, which I shall do inshallah. Most of the atheists we realize have become atheists because they believe in science and technology. These people think that science has advanced so much, we don't require any scripture, we don't require any religion, etc. The first question I ask to the atheist is, that suppose there is an equipment, there is a machinery, which no one in the world has ever seen before. If it's bought in front of you, if it's bought in front of the atheist, and if we ask the question to him, that who will be the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of this machinery or this object, what can be his reply? What can he reply? Suppose a machinery who no one in the world has seen, if it's bought in front of the atheist, and he's asked the question, who will be the first person who will tell you the mechanism of this machinery or object? The reply the atheist will give you is the first person who will tell you the mechanism is the manufacturer. Some may say the creator. Some may say the inventor. Some may say the producer. Whatever they say, it will be somewhat similar. Either they say the creator, the manufacturer, the producer, the inventor. It will be somewhat similar. Just keep it at the back of your mind. Then ask them the next question. That how did our universe come into existence? So the atheist will tell us that initially there was a primary nebula. Then there was a big bang. There was a secondary separation which gave rise to galaxies, the sun, the moon, and the earth on which we live. This we call as a Big Bang. When did you come to know about this creation of the universe? So he will tell you, about 30-40 years back, the scientists that discovered this. You ask him the question, but what you are talking about the Big Bang is already mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30, which says, Avalam yaral kafuru. Do not the unbelievers see. Anna samawati wal arda. Kaanatrat kansakna huma. That the heavens and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder. What you're talking about, the Big Bang, is already mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned that? So the atheist will say, maybe it's a fluke. No problem. Don't argue with him. You continue. The light of the moon, is it its own light? or reflected light. So the atheist will tell us that previously we thought the moon has its own light. Recently we have come to know in science, recently means 100 years back, 200 years back, we have come to know that the light of the moon is not its own light but a reflected light. The Quran mentioned 1400 years ago in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 61, that blessed is he who had placed the constellation in the sky and placed therein a lamp, a sun, having its own light and moon having reflected light or borrowed light. The Arabic word used for moonlight in the Quran is munir or nur, meaning reflected light or borrowed light. Who could have mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago that the light of the moon is not its own light but reflected light which we have come to know recently? The atheist may say, your prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, maybe he was an intelligent man. Don't argue with him. Continue. The world that we live on What's the shape of this earth on which we live? The atheist will tell you, it is spherical. When did we come to know? So he will tell us, 19, it was 1597 when Sir Francis Drake, when he sailed around the earth, that he proved that the earth was spherical. But the Quran says 1400 years ago, in Surah Naziat, chapter number 79, verse number 30, Wal arda baada zalika dahaha. And thereafter, we have made the earth x shape. The Arabic word the haha, one of its meaning is the earth is an expanse. 
The other meaning is derived from the Arabic word duya, which means an egg. And it doesn't refer to a normal egg. It refers to the egg of an ostrich. And we know the world is not completely round like a ball, but it is geospherical in shape. It is starting from the pole. And if you analyze the shape of the egg of an ostrich, that too is geospherical in shape. Who could have mentioned 1400 years ago that the shape of the earth is geospherical? Again, the atheist may say, you know, your prophet, maybe he was super intelligent. Don't argue with him. You can continue. When I was in school, I had learned that the sun was stationary. It revolved, but did not rotate about its own axis. So the atheist will say, is that mentioned in the Quran? I say, no, that is what I learned in school. When I passed my school in 1982, approximately 12 years back, I had learned the sun was stationary, did not rotate about its own axis. But the Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 33, it is Allah who has created the night and the day. The sun and the moon. Each one traveling in orbit with its own motion. So the Quran says that besides the sun revolving, it even rotates about its own axis. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran 1400 years ago? And the atheist will be silent. There will be a long pause. Don't wait for the reply. You can keep on continuing. Today, Science tells us that the universe is expanding, which is mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago in Surah Dhariyat, chapter number 51, verse number 47. The Quran speaks about the water cycle which we learned in school. It was so Bernard Palissy in 1580 who first described the water cycle, how the water evaporate from the ocean, forms into clouds, moves into the interior, falls down as rain. This water cycle is spoken about in great detail in the Quran in several verses. In Surah Az-Zumur, chapter 39, verse 21. In Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse 24. In Surah Hijar, chapter 15, verse 22. In Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 18. In Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 43. In Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse 48. In Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 17. In Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse 40 to 49. In Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 9. In Surah Yasin, chapter number 36, verse number 34. In Surah Mul, chapter number 67, verse number 30. In Surah Tariq, chapter number 86, verse number 11. There are hundreds of verses in the Quran which only speak about the water cycle which science has discovered recently. We can keep on talk, talking that today we have come to know that the plants have got sexes which we did not know earlier. Quran says in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 53, that the plants have got sexes, male and female. Today we have come to know that there are two types of water, sweet and salty. And there's a barrier between them, which is mentioned in the Quran in Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse 53, and Surah Rahman, chapter 55, verse 17 and 18. It is Allah who has let free two bodies of flowing water. Though they meet, they are not mix. There is a barrier between them. Today, science tells us that it is the mountains which prevent the earth from shaking, which is mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago in Surah Naba, chapter number 78 verse number six and seven the quran speaks about biology that we have created every living creature from water every living thing in surah ambiya chapter 21 verse number 30 quran mentions this 1400 years ago the quran speaks about zoology about the lifestyle of the spider in surah ankabut chapter 29 verse 41 about the ant in surah namal chapter 27 verse 17 to 18 about the bee in surah nahal chapter number 16 verse 66 68 69 the Quran speaks about embryology in Surah Alaq, chapter 96, verse number 1 and 2. We have created the human being from alaqa, a leech-like substance, which we have come to know recently. The Quran speaks about embryological stages in Surah Mu'minun, chapter 23, verse number 12 to 14. You can go on talking about the scientific points. There are more than a thousand verses in the Quran which speak about science. After every scientific fact, you ask the question, who could have mentioned that in the Quran? The only reply the atheist can give you is the creator, the, the cherisher, the manufacturer, the inventor, the producer. This creator, this manufacturer, this producer, this inventor, we Muslims call him as Allah. That's the reason Francis Bacon, a very famous philosopher said, little knowledge of science takes you away from Almighty God. In-depth knowledge of science makes you a believer in God. 
That's the reason today scientists are not eliminating God, they're eliminating models of God. La ilaha illallah. Hope that answers the question. Okay, uh, unfortunately, we have gone over our time for this session. I know all of you must be enjoying it as much as I am. So uh, this session is now closed. Um, I'll pass it on to the next uh, MC to take over, inshallah.